Hey, how's it going everyone? Welcome to the stream. So uh, let's uh, let's get right into it. So last uh, last week we um, we worked on uh, inter starting to integrate the CPP DAP into uh, uh, basically into Vectrexy. Uh, we did that. We actually have it now as a dependency here. Um, added as a sub module. We are building it, and I make actually able to include it despite what this guy says here. <clears throat> uh, we're able to create a session and all that. So. So now what I'm going to start doing is actually implementing it. Uh, last time we also managed to take this hello debugger example uh, and actually uh, get it going. Um, since the last stream, I actually opened the pull request on uh, for this hello debugger example to sort of change the way it works to make it behave more like an actual uh, debugger with a program that, that loops because uh, right now, one thing that's odd about it is like if you hit a five, you see like we're we're able to step through it and it loops. But if you hit a five to keep running, so now we're in the running state. Now if you pause, it'll it'll pause and you'll keep going. But you'll notice that if you run and then say set a breakpoint, which uh, for some reason doesn't seem to be working on this version, but on my laptop that seems to be working. Add inline breakpoints, no? Anyway, I don't know why it's not working here, but normally when you set a breakpoint, uh, you would expect it to stop because you would expect that it's running and running and running, but it's actually not. Um, it's because it's basically paused. So I have a pull request that says, let's keep it running um, so that if you set a breakpoint, it behaves as you would expect. Um, now, whether that gets merged in or not, that's pretty much what we're gonna be doing for for Vectrexy. <clears throat> so let me uh, let me get into that. So one thing I was thinking is it would be really good for me to sort of have the um, to start perhaps with something similar to what this this hello debugger is doing, which is to create. Uh, I think I'll do it manually for now, but to create like my own you know plugin, and then we can sort of make it more official uh, later on. So to do that, it does kind of bother me though that this thing doesn't work for. Uh, let me let me just update this just in case it's related. I'll just close some of these. I would really like those debug like the breakpoints to work because if that doesn't work, then uh, you know I won't have much luck with my own setting breakpoints, right? <clears throat> yeah, let's close that. Don't know if this has been updated. Okay, actually, it wasn't updated yet. Let's give this a second. Ah, there we go. Let me just install that. What I was talking about before was... Hmm, was here in the VS Code extensions folder. You can see all the extensions that are in here and then there's one of them here which is, okay, this guy's been uh, reloaded. So one of them is this Google CPP DAP Hello Debugger 1.0.0. So we're gonna do something similar for, for Vectrexy. Um, okay, so let me just see now. If I hit a five, can I set breakpoints? Still not. Very strange that that doesn't work. I 
on step at f10, I put a breakpoint here, f9, and I hit f5. No, see? f6 should pause. Actually, this reminds me, maybe that I think there's an option to be able to set breakpoints, allow breakpoints everywhere. Maybe that's the problem. Let's see now if that works. So if I do that, <clears throat> ah, there we go. Okay, so that works. So what I was saying is, see, if I'm running like this and I set a breakpoint here, it won't stop. In order for it to stop, I actually need to pause and then hit F5. Then it'll go there, which is sort of a confusing behavior, in my opinion, because it doesn't really mimic how you know typical debugger in, in a program that's running would work, especially since this program loops over and over. Um, so I, I wrote about that on the pull request, and uh, Ben, the, uh, the author, and, and my colleague actually agrees that it makes sense that we uh, do something about it. So <clears throat> he um, he suggested a, a slightly different way of doing it than mine, and uh, so I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll get that merged uh, soon enough. Um, okay, so that's great. So let's say now that we want something similar. So all we really need, yeah, and one thing too is this one works by actually copying the executable there as well which yeah okay what we're gonna do is since we're developing this I'm gonna create a folder and I'll call it uh, I don't know what what should I call it hey my rhino dot backtrexy um, Vectrix C debugger, I suppose. Dash. Let's go 1.0.0. Okay. So this package.json for us will look a little bit different. Let's give it the right name. I guess it should be the same name, right? Yeah. Publisher, but let's give it a type. We'll call it Vectrex C Debugger. So here for the program, I'm going to point it specifically at my my uh, executable that I'm building, so that this way we can iterate over it. Uh, probably eventually, I'll do something where when I build, I'll you know, copy it out to the VS Code folder and all that. Uh, but I think for now, I should be able to just point it at my release build that I create here. I think it goes into here. Yeah. X64. So this one right here. 
copy as path. I don't know if there's like a, a path. There's args, runtime args. What's the difference between that? Oh, that's an optional runtime. It's args. Optional args to pass to the adapter and optional runtime args. Okay. Variables, window. All right. So I think program should be like this with forward slashes. Or maybe two. that label by label same thing as a display name Okay, so something like this. Um, all right, so now what we'll do is we will go to create a new window. We'll open up my Vectrex Pong game, because actually this is the one we want to be able to debug, right? And we'll set it up. So like this one here was set up with a, excuse me, um, launch. Yeah, it's a launch.json. So we want to do the same thing. Actually, I don't have a launch right now. I wonder if I could find my debugger in here now. I guess not. So there you go. See Vectrex C debugger here. <coughs> so pick that up just by parsing that JSON file. Um, what we want is we want to launch. How do I create a launch file again? I don't know if the name is so important. Definitely the type is important. Like that. Let's say I remove this. Is this not... Uh... Make sure you have a, the debug type is not recognized. Make sure that you have a corresponding debug extension installed and that it is enabled. Vectrexy debugger, it is enabled. Hey, what's up, uh, Calton Rill? I don't know if I'm saying that right. I saw you making this emulator. You're gonna make an RPG like you did back in the day with Firebell. Wow, that is an interesting reference. Uh, 
rack. Yeah, that rings a bell. Did were you? Uh, I guess you were more in contact with with Nathan. With uh, or I don't know with who, barely. Yeah, I remember that. Oh my goodness, that's a long time ago. <laughs> what were you doing? Were you also making homebrew games at the time? Oh, wait a minute. You were making an FF2 style. I totally remember. Didn't, didn't we used to talk like a lot? Yes, we did. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Man, you and I used to, to, to chat quite a lot. Yeah. I remember your FF2 game. It was actually really good. <laughs> wow, man. Long time no uh, no speak. Like a long time, right? <laughs> it's like over 15 years or something. Yeah, man. How'd you find me? Like, how'd you end up here? Oh, look at that. It actually launched it. Cool. You got nostalgic a year ago? Okay. All right. So a year ago, you got nostalgic. And then what? So for those of you watching the stream or watch, watching the, the VOD later, uh, so Firebell, I think I, I can actually show it. Let's see if I can. Where was Firebell again? <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> so Firebell, yeah, it totally still exists. Um, so when I when I was young and starting to program uh, back in the day, I also f stumbled upon this. There was, so there was a guy, uh, Nathan, who um, was making games. He made a whole bunch of games. In uh, he was like he was basically making like NES or Super NES style games for the for DOS back in the day. And I was like super interested in that. And so I, I had reached out to him and he actually taught me quite a lot about how to make this, uh, how to make games like this. And I effectively joined the team. Like if you go here, this is, see here, Fire Fireball was founded in 1996 by Nathan Yam and uh, Remy Seville, who I never actually met uh, even online. Um, and then you'll go here and like, you'll see somewhere down here. Let me see. So this is this was me. Um, <laughs> yeah, the website hasn't changed. Um, yeah, you can see here this is really really old, and in fact, yeah, it links to this, but I don't think this works anymore. No, that doesn't work. But but actually, I think if you go to like Firebell and you go to you write Guardian Soft here. Yeah, there you go. So this is our page, and these are the games we made back in the day. I don't know if you remember, I was working on Zelda PC here, <laughs> and Hisa was doing Pipe War, and then I did some Tetris stuff. This is my Tetris uh, port to the BlackBerry, it's like the very first BlackBerry. <laughs> then the Tetris Master. Connect 4 GL when I was learning OpenGL. Yeah, these are good times. This is how it all started. See, my last post here was March 17, 2004. This is just before I got um, hired, at, hired at EA. I even write about it here. One final bit of news is that Electronic Arts, one of the largest game companies out there, has opened a studio here in my hometown of Montreal. And I was recently hired there as a full-time software engineer. Uh, so yeah, that was uh, 
I started at EA in 2004 after that. So yeah, blast from the past, man. <laughs> so yeah, so this this warning here doesn't seem to be a problem. It actually is picking up my debugger. Like if I put two here and then hit a five, it's gonna fail. But if I put it back and hit a five, it actually launches my emulator. So there you go. <clears throat> I got hooked on EverQuest and then WoW and disappeared from programming until 2010. And then what, you got back into it? Worked at a telephone cable company. Did you like doing database reports, C-sharp, Java, Python, Ruby? Did you like uh, finish, like did you go to, to university and do computer science or something like that? Or did you just like enter uh, the workforce and like, you know, self-taught type of thing? Got a BS and CS, cool. And so, so a year ago, you were doing some digging. You found Firebell and all that. Hey, Jono. <laughs> and uh, and then what? Like, how did you did you stumble upon me back then? And and did you know I was streaming and all that? Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, so I guess you saw that I, I wasn't streaming for a long time. I just recently got back to it, like after like a something like 10 month hiatus. Right. Well, anyway, it's, uh, it's cool to talk to you again. Okay, so I'm gonna try and uh, start working on it. So what's cool now is that if I hit a five, it launches Vectrexy. Now, obviously, it's launching it like you know, just a regular thing with the the default game. So that's not helpful. Um, actually, another thing I notice is that it's launching it without the console, which is fine. That's going to be how we, we're going to want to launch it. So let me see, because basically, what's happening is when it launches it, it's going to use the uh, stood in and stood out to talk to Vectrexy. And so all my stuff where I'm outputting and all that, I'm going to have to turn that off um, so that I can read from standard in and standard out uh, using CPP DAP, uh, which is fine because actually I don't really do much input output. I do some for like errors and stuff like that, but I'll, I'll uh, have to turn that off. Give me a sec. Um, okay, you know what? Just, just give me a second. I'll be right back.
<laughs> hey, sorry about that. All right, let's get some some of this going. So what do I want to do? Um, let me go to my main here. So right now I've got this DAP debugger here. And basically I'm going to have to like do that instead of my normal debugger. So I'm going to hack at it for now. Yeah, so basically the magic is going to be here. Instead of doing this, we're going to want to do something similar. And I guess I'll need that. You know, I'll pass the same exact, exact same args and we'll worry about changing this later like this. You know, now that I think about it, I actually did some of this work when I was exploring. Did I ever push that stuff? Let me see here. Yeah, GDB stub. So when I was exploring the GDB stub avenue, which I spoke about a few streams ago, um, this this wasn't working. Basically, as I was saying, as uh, you know, we, we don't produce a, an elf with dwarf symbols, so I couldn't use the GDB stub thing. However. I had started implementing sort of like the basic, let me see here. Look at this. Uh, this is not very nice. Let me do uh, open. Yeah, so there's my frame update. But what I really wanted to see was Open this with VS Code. <coughs> Excuse me. Frame update. Because I had done some work here. That's what it was. This is what I wanted. Execute frame instructions. I had started doing this. So I think this this would be a good start right here, just because it like I'm, I was effectively copying out of the debugger the minimal amount of stuff that I needed uh, in order to start executing instructions and get the, the the actual emulator working. So let me uh let me try to get that in there. I have execute frame and then execute instructions. So I'll just copy both of these. And I think these would go below here. Um, let me grab my header file as well while I'm at it.
Okay. And one more thing. Okay. Yeah, I'll worry about that later. All right, so basically every time we do frame update, we'll do execute frame instructions. Uh, execute as many instructions as I can fit in this time slice. So basically all this commented out code is the stuff that got copied from the debugger. Um, obviously most of it will be deleted. I'm just thinking about how I won't be able to do printf's like this anymore. Um, for like <clears throat> logging and stuff, I'll probably need to like create a <clears throat> a file stream, and that's pretty much what CPP DAP does as well. So I'll look into that. But for now, this should be good. So I think with this, let me see if this builds. Not quite. Oh yes, unreferenced parameters. I think I had that covered as well. You can see I'd done quite a bit of work on implementing GDB, uh, <clears throat> the GDB stub, and unfortunate, unfortunately I can't use it, but it's all right. So actually, why did I have to do that? This is used, input is used. Maybe it was in here actually. Where was this coming from? 30, no, it was, it was coming saying mu events okay so that's the only one <laughs> uh so um so yeah so dap dap is the debug adapter protocol and uh it's basically a protocol that microsoft created let me see if I, I think i have it open here <clears throat> Yeah, it's this one here, or I don't know where I have the page. But basically it is a protocol. Here we go, here we go. So I guess this is what you found, right? And I, I like this overview here. This picture sort of explains the idea behind DAP is that <clears throat> You know, typically if you're developing an IDE or an editor or some other tool that needs to do debugging, um, the way it would work is that, let's say uh, Visual Studio or VS Code or uh, Emacs, Vim, each of them would have their own like debugging module that they've written. So everyone would have their own copy, right? Of, you know, everyone has their own Python debugger module that they've written. Um, and then that would connect to, you know, some, some debugger system, right? And the problem with this is that each IDE or editor and all that has to rewrite this part here. And these parts are, are quite extensive. You know what I mean? So like Node.js here would need to connect, the debugger needs to connect to a Node.js instance 
the Python debugger needs to connect to like a Python instance, right? So Python is running the program and the Python debugger talks to Python uh, to figure out how to execute instructions and get all the information. Um, but the problem is that this Python debugger instance right here is, and this one here, they're quite similar uh, and quite complex, but they're, they're in different places. And so everyone sort of has to reinvent the wheel every time. It's like if you're going to make a new editor, you're like, oh, now I got to add debugging support. It's a, it's a ton of work. So the idea behind the debug adapter protocol, as it says here, is to standardize an abstract protocol. Oh, and also another thing so I wanted to mention is, um, is that if you support multiple debuggers, you also have to write each one separately, right? So Python, how this debugger works is totally different from, say, how the C Sharp debugger would work because these runtimes are completely different, right? Mm -hmm. So the idea here was to create this protocol, an abstract protocol for like generic debugging. And then in your IDE, you only write this one generic debugger um, that can basically speak and, and basically debug anything through this protocol. And then DAP is this protocol. Uh, and then what you do is you write, and the reason for DAP there is debug adapter protocol, because the idea is that there are these adapters that are written externally and then those external adapters know how to talk to that runtime in order to translate these generic uh, debugging commands into something specific, right? So like setting a breakpoint is pretty much how all debuggers work. How to do that specifically for Node.js will be different from Python, will be different from C Sharp. So the adapter does the work of say, setting the breakpoint and talking to the runtime. Um, and then that allows, it frees you from from having to worry about those details and just write something that's generic. Um, now, in, what's really cool about this is that, what it means is that like, right now we have a say VS Code or uh, Visual Studio or Emacs, Vim, and there may be other implementations. I think we can see them here. Uh, so these are the implementations of the protocols. That's not what I wanted to see. Supporting tools, is that the one? I wanted to see like the, Oh, here, here we go. So you can see here, a bunch. there's already a bunch of tools that support DAP. So VS Code, Visual Studio, uh, Eclipse, uh, Emacs, Thea, Vim, uh, Cloud Studio. So anyway, and then, you know, so this, this is really cool, right? So it means that like, I see which, which one, the generic debugger or the DAP is doing the syntax lexical parsing. Um, So, I mean, it depends, right? I think it depends. I think most of the heavy lifting is usually done by the debugger, like the, the runtime itself, because it, it has knowledge of that. And the adapter is sort of like just adapting this debug interface uh, that's exposed uh, and matching, you know, mapping it to this generic one. So most of the heavy lifting is already there. Like if you think about it, you know, like I don't know Node very well, but I know let's say Python or C Sharp, they, these environments totally have debugging support built in, right? Um, so, so you know, like I think for Python, if you want to write a debugger for Python, there's some kind of uh, protocol. I forget what the um, how it works, but you you launch the runtime and then you you can send uh, some serialized format uh, to get like debug information. Uh, C sharp does actually like C sharp classes for debugging that you can create and communicate with the runtime. So, so most of the heavy lifting is done there and then the, 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 pro, the adapter just needs to kind of you know, do the translation there. So, uh, so what I'm doing is, in my case, you can think of like these two boxes are gonna be one box. In my case, it's the, the one box will be Vectrexy, my emulator. Uh, my emulator will implement the adapter protocol and this part is the actual debugger itself, all of it in one application, okay? And um, and then basically, let's say using VS Code or whatever, any one of these that supports generic debugging through DAP, you'll be able to say open one of the Vectrex programs you've written, like, like the one I wrote here. Um, not this one. Yeah, here. So this is like my Pong game, you know, for, for the Vectrex. Like if you run this, it'll launch the game, it'll compile it using a C++ compiler, GCC, and then it'll actually launch it. 
And there's my pawn game. Yeah, so this way the ID can debug the Vectrex code. So, so you'll write, like, like you can see here, you write your Vectrex code. Uh, whoops, I don't know what I just did there. You'll write your Vectrex code in C++ like this. But I want to be able to say, you know, put a breakpoint here and hit a five and have it start, you know, running and hit a breakpoint and start looking at variables and all that. The thing is, is that uh, normally with GCC, you, you compile an elf and you can say, you know, give me debug symbols and you'll get like dwarf symbols in there. Uh, and w for that, you know, I could have done what I was trying to do, which is implement what's called a GDB stub, where you talk to GDB and then GDB has its own text-based protocol and you can say, hey, please set a breakpoint and all that. That's sort, sort of where I was going. But unfortunately, this fork of GCC that's being used to build a C++ or C for Vectrex, -y, uh, sorry, for the Vectrex, um, it does not generate ELF. It generates this this other format. It's it's often used for embedded systems. It's kind of like a text file with a, a binary binary uh, dump in there, <clears throat> and you just sort of copy the you know that binary directly to the um, the flash or whatever it is, and then it gets you know run by your system. So it's very common for embedded systems. So the only debugging stuff I get is I get these these files these uh, rst files I could show you here so when i compile I, I get these external files for each one of my cpps i get these these kind of listings <clears throat> these like uh here is like for my main cpp i get main.rst and when you look at those files these are just text files right but in there there are these these uh directives that start with stab So, so stab, stab is basically this like really old, uh, also an old thing there, but it's basically here it is stabs. So it's it's a debug data format for storing information. About, so basically, it's like it's like debug info, and it says here you know at one at one stage stabs was widely used on Unix systems, but the newer dwarf format has largely supplanted it. Since I don't have dwarf, I'm stuck with stabs, uh, and so I've actually written a stab parser. So. You know, I parse all. I parse basically the information that I need because this basically gives me mappings of source file. Like this is here a mapping of a source file, and then the instructions that go with it. So this says uh, in the source current in source base dot h at line forty five. I think it is uh, these instructions here uh, map to that to that to that line. So there's a line of code here. These are the three instructions that map to it. So I parse all this, I store it in a, in a symbol server, like a symbol database, and now I'm writing the debug adapter protocol so that I can do the source line stepping. <clears throat> hey, uh, fake Pyrie. So how boilerplate is DAP? I looked at creating a language server at one point, but noped noped out when I saw how many thousands of lines of tedious TypeScript it would be. So actually DAP I don't think is so bad, um, especially since I'm going to be using uh, CPP DAP, which is uh, it's a library that actually one of my colleagues uh, wrote. It's it's really good. It's uh, where do I, where do I have it? <clears throat> Can I like close it? Oh, here it is. So this is CPP DAP. Um, it's a C++ li library that implements the DAP, the debug adapter protocol. So, you know, it, he did most of the le heavy lifting uh, in here, um, all the network and protocol event stuff and made it really, really easy to use. So uh, it's true that if I had to do it from scratch, there'd be quite a bit of, of work for me to do. Uh, it, it, it's mainly, um, you know, it's, it's a, uh, Kind of HTML or web sockets like looking uh, protocol. <clears throat> you know, you, you you create like a what do you call them? You you create like H. I think I think it is actually HTML based. Yeah, let me see here. Yeah, see, the, so the base protocol exchanges messages that consists of a header and a content part comparable to HTTP. Uh, I'm sorry, not HTML, I meant HTTP. Uh, the header and content parts are separated by carriage return, line feed. Uh, and then, you know, you, so, so 
very much like what you'd see in HTTP with content and all that. So all of this is what CppDAP does and it actually gives you a really nice interface and you, you just kind of plug it in. It also takes care of spawning threads, uh, doing all the, all the networking that might be necessary. So all that's kind of taken care of, um, which is why I'm, I'm using it. Otherwise I'd have obviously a lot more work to do. Um, so yeah, I, I guess it, it, it takes care of the boilerplate and, and exposes a nice C++ like simple interface uh, for you to implement, if that answers your question. <clears throat> so, all right, so did I, did I get this building yet? Right, so I gotta return a value here. Mm, maybe not with caps lock. So let's see if this runs. So you can see here it's parsing all those RST files, super slow. Uh, okay. What is it that I'm missing here? Oh yeah, right. I've got null pointers. Uh, so yeah, let me let me do some proper init here. <clears throat> Sorry, I, my uh, my throat's bugging me. I've had like a cold for like forever, unfortunately. go to my main <laughs> yeah more like I'm at the end of a cold and so you know how like it gets stuck in your throat at one point <clears throat> okay so now hopefully this will run without crashing I'm really gonna have to speed up that RST parsing. All right, cool. Looks like it's working. Super slowly too. Ah, because I'm in debug, yeah. That makes sense. Let me uh, switch to release here. It's x64 release. <clears throat> My debug build is so slow. I've, I have looked into it, why it's so slow. It mainly has to do with uh, the fact that the, I think it's the CPU implementation, uh, a lot of it is not being optimized. I sort of rely on the fact that the optimizer can see through the many, like the long switch case and the many functions and, you know, inline functions I'm calling, but the debugger doesn't see that. So it, it there's a lot of overhead uh, in the CPU implementation. So that shows up pretty high on the, the profile in debug. <clears throat> One time I tried to do force in line to try to force in line everything just to see if I could fix, you know, sort of override the what the debugger does. And all I ended up doing was um, making a big mess and stack overflowing uh, at runtime because I, I, I over inlined and I ended up with a massive stack and it couldn't handle it. 
So I, anyway, someday I'll get back to it, but I don't really care. When, what I do now is I, I work in release, and when I need to debug something, I can compile that single CPP without uh, optimizing it, and I usually have everything I need. All right, so here we go. The stream keeps buffering. Is that on my end though? Because to me, it looks like the stream is pretty, pretty solid. Looking here at my bit rate, looks, looks all right. Maybe your end. I hope so. I don't know if others are are noticing, but if, if anyone else is noticing um, stream buffering problems, do let me know. Um, okay, so this is good. <clears throat> so, like you know, some of this debugging, printing stuff that I'm doing, I won't be able to do it anymore. It just stood out. Um, It's exactly because of what I was saying is that this DAP protocol actually uses uh, the standard input, standard output to communicate. I, there might be another way to do it. That actually would be nice. But I think the way CPP DAP has been done uh, is that it it will do it right now to stood in, stood out. Oh, all right. Thanks, uh, the uncler. Yeah. So I don't know if there's like student students that I see here. It's a single session mode. In this mode, the development tool starts a debug adapter as a standalone process and communicates with it through stood in and stood out. So that's pretty much what we're doing. There's also multi-session mode, and that that might be what what I do ultimately. I was thinking about that, you know, maybe, and I don't know. I guess I, I have to look if CPP that uh, supports that. But right now, I'm just gonna go with the, with this single session mode and and see how that goes. And I think actually in console out put here, I have a way. Of setting my my print stream so I could at least set my print stream to point to something else yeah I could override the print stream here and set it to a, like a file to anything actually so maybe that's what I'll do uh, because otherwise we're gonna get all kinds of problems so for now let me do this. Hmm. I'm trying to think what's the, the right move here. I'll do this for now. Console out.
and I will need a file stream so let's open one I'm not going to call that. I'm going to call it, um, I'll call it print stream. Oh, and actually, I think I'm going to have to hold on to that pointer. Um, so apparently I am. Uh, so yeah, I haven't actually received any income yet, but apparently I'm set up for it. <clears throat> oh, sorry, I missed your message from before. Uh, oh, hey, thanks, man. So yeah, thanks for uh, for hanging out and uh, for reconnecting. Hope I'll uh, hope I'll see you around. And thanks for the bits. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, and thanks for the subscribe. <laughs> so okay, actually, I think I'm just gonna leak this stream for now. So let's see what happens with this. Oh, thanks, man. It's nice of you, Jono. All right, so now there should be no more. Yeah, you see there's no more output here. This initial output, unfortunately, will also have to go, um, I think. I do wonder how robust uh, the DAP protocol is to like, you know, stood out that it's unaware of. It probably doesn't mind if there's an, some initial stuff, but once it starts sending uh, things to it, it probably wants, it doesn't want any more, you know, <clears throat> any more garbage to appear. But yeah, I'll probably need to override even at a higher level than what I'm doing here. Now I think about it. Yeah, I need to think about a bit about this. Okay, you know what? Maybe what I'll do is I'll move this up for now, not here, and I'll do it in my SDL engine. Or maybe in main. Create an engine, touch to the client, run it. Yeah, no, I'll do it here. Here to do. Um, if we launch for DAP debugging, uh, route our print stuff to a file. I'm also going to need to like route, I think, the error thing as well. I think uh, this only routes the print stream, if I recall. Let me see.
Yeah. Let me add that as well. So I just basically added some more stuff here. Um, do I even use this, this one here? Of course, calling it override print stream now makes less sense. Actually, you know what I'll do? I'll, I'll do something else. I will instead just create Even if it's, you know, mainly copy paste, I don't really care. Okay, so let's do that. Because this way we'll get absolutely nothing in the stood out, which is I think the, the safest thing for us to do for all of this to work. So thinking about what's next, um, okay, so next I guess I'm gonna have to start, now that I'm running the game, I need to start implementing the dApp stuff. Oh, hey, what's up, Pyro? Did you tell me you're like five hours ahead or something? So it's like super early, like, early in the morning or late or however you want to say it. So now we should get no output here. Perfect. And now if I close, we should go see, um, there should be a file Can't sleep. Well, I'll try to put you to sleep then. 4.30 a.m., oh man. Um, there's print stream. Okay, perfect. So here we can see the output. Interestingly, we didn't see, I expected to see actually, the output from find and set root path here. Why didn't we see that guy? This printf right here. Oh wait, no, I know what's happening. This is not the latest file, is it? This is before. So where is the other print stream? And 4.30. That uh, is, you're gonna have a rough day after this.
All right, <laughs> it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. Find and set root path sets the root path. So right now I'm running in whatever is the current working directory. Uh. <laughs> That's just funny. The truth is I, sh I probably shouldn't be printing in here. Let me see something. Engine util, what if we did In fact, I can just use FS current path, couldn't I? Let's say I remove this, remove this as well. I, I remember why I did this. It was because I wanted this to be somewhat generic because I have um, I have that other that other null engine thing that I wrote. Okay, let me just do this for now. I'll, I'll revisit what to do about that printing later. This should now create a file right here in the root. And there it is. Okay, that's good. I'll leave it like this for now. Coming here. So Pyro, you've been working on your uh, your PS1 mod. So I saw you were streaming it. Those of you who are interested in uh, in hardware and hardware hacking, you should follow Pyro's stream. He also streams on Twitch. You're still working on it? Sorry, I haven't been able to catch your stream. It's usually at a off hour for me as well. It's done. People have already installed it in their PS1 from what I can see on Twitter. Man, that's really cool. It must be really rewarding to, to know people are actually using your design. <clears throat> that's cool, man. Congrats. So yeah, I'm just looking at here at some of this, uh, some DAP code here. So I think what we're going to do is if I look here at create, this returns a unique pointer to a DAP session. That's a class. 
class in namespace dap. Okay. So, <coughs> sort of wondering if I want to include dap in here or not. Probably not. I always kind of have this issue of like, what do I want to forward declare? I think what unique pointer is you can forward declare, but it's not always awesome. to put a constructor and destructor. This is this is why I don't like the unique pointer hiding stuff, but it's all right. At least you can say equals default. That You say it's cheap? You mean like buying the components is are not uh, it's not too expensive? I gotta take a look at, at your mod. I don't actually have a PS1 though, but uh, I just wanna see how it works. So now I'd like to have a Make like an init dap function. You know, I'm just going to call this session. Oh, that's pretty cool. So, so what's the deal with the what's the PSIO? I don't have a PSIO. So create the DAP session, hard code identifier. So definitely I'll be hard coding my thread ID because that's not something that will be changing for us. We only have one thread, uh, but not for the rest. That's for sure. Uh, signal events, configured, terminate, terminated, or terminate, I suppose. Okay, so event handlers for the debugger. So this is, this is what's cool about CPP DAP is you just kind of create these, uh, <clears throat> whoops, Let's try that again. Create these lambdas and you just sort of register them like this. Really nice, really simple. So I'll, I'll copy a, a few of these. Now in our case, I'm gonna to wanna to do these kind of event things as well. 
I'm still uh, still on the fence on, on like how I exactly I want to implement this. Probably what I should do is have some kind of like command Q or something like that. Um, but I think I'm going to start with something a bit simpler than that. So we've got stepped, breakpoint hit, and pause. So the PSIO is a device you plug in the back of the PS1 and it's like uh, one of those flash cartridges for the Super NES with an SD card, but for the PlayStation. Oh, I see. Right, right, right. Yeah, fair enough. I haven't seen... Uh, I haven't seen the one lone coders uh, thing. Um, is it good? Okay, I'm guessing this is a DAP debugger event. Oh, I see, okay. Oh, this is his own thing. Okay, I might not do it this way then. This is not actually part of the session stuff. You're enjoying it? That's good. Does a good job explaining presentation rule. He uses the presentation rule on his videos. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them. Tell them what you told them. Oh, that's. That does sound like a good, uh, good way to do it. All right. Let me let me get rid of this here. <clears throat> I'll figure out how I do that later. He's writing it in C++ and I think he's rendering via his own engine, which I think is on GitHub. That's cool. Yeah. Oh, so you watch that. Uh, so yeah, things are going really well. Um, really enjoying my job. Uh, I work on some really interesting technology. If you wanna, if you wanna learn a bit about it, it's uh, it's called Swift Shader. It's open source. If you look up Swift Shader, it's one word. 
it is on github though the the official page is on googlesource.com here um so yeah this is basically what, what i work on it's as it says here it's a high performance cpu based implementation of vulkan OpenGLES. no longer direct 3d9 though um graphics apis uh, its goal is to provide hardware independence for advanced graphics um so the, the, so basically it is it actually is a driver like it is a Vulkan driver and it's an OpenGL ES driver and uh, but instead of you know using a GPU it actually targets the CPU um, and it's and it, it's used by you know quite a lot of products out there uh, for Google it's used by Chrome by Android uh, and some other internal stuff um, it's pretty neat the, the, the tech behind it is really cool because it's, you know, targeting the CPU uh, means generally that it should be quite a lot slower, but you'd be surprised at the kind of performance we can get, uh, you know, out of using different techniques. Mainly, uh, one of the main, obviously one of the main things is that it's using, uh, you know, parallelism through, um, you know, multi-threading, but also through um, SIMD. But the main one of the main reasons that it's, it can be so high performance is that it does just in time compilation, so JIT. Uh, so it's able to like really target your CPU and generate, uh, you know, generate code for shaders and generate code for all kinds of stuff for blitting, rasterization, uh, you know, using setups that are based on the user's configuration. And so it avoids lots of like, you know, runtime. Um, condition runtime branching so it's, it's got a lot of really cool technology all stuff that i did not know when joining and so i like a lot to learn and it's been super fun because you know learning new tech right so i'm thinking here what it is it what is it that i want to do um Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite happy, uh, quite happy about it. Don't know what this is about. If log. Oh, so DAP even has all this like file logging and stuff. That's kind of cute. Yeah, that's pretty cool actually. Well, in my case, I'll just use my printf stuff since. So that should work. Um, now, I'm not going to want to do something like this. If I get an error, then what it means is that the next time I execute, I probably want to return false.
I'm gonna, I'm gonna need to iterate on this stuff quite a bit. For now, I'm just gonna kinda go for basic skeleton thing here. So we'll just put like a little bool here. Something like that. The initialize requests the first message sent from the client and the response reports debugger capabilities. Okay. Cool. So you can already see how this is really nice, right? Because basically CPPDAP actually produce, has, has like classes for all the response types. And if I'm not mistaken, I think these are generated. Yeah, so it's generated with a, a Go script. So I don't know, I think it analyzes uh, somewhere, something, in order to generate all these, these types. So you can see like these are all the things that you can say your debugger supports. Completion triggers, exception, breakpoint filters, support terminate debuggy. So at some point I'm gonna have to look at this. The debugger supports the cancel request, completion conditional breakpoints, supports data breakpoints, this we should be able to do. Delayed stack trace loading. Oh, supports a disassemble request. That's interesting. And I say that's interesting just because VS Code doesn't uh, do disassembly. So I wonder if they will eventually support this. I definitely want to be able to see the disassembly, so um, maybe I'll stop using VS Code and actually use Visual Studio at one point, which definitely does disassembly. Uh, but I don't know what it takes for Visual Studio to be able to uh, do the DAP thing. It's, it's obviously really simple with VS Code, which is why I'm starting with that. So yeah, you can see a whole bunch of stuff. Support evaluate for hovers. Uh, that's cool too. So set variable, set expression, restart request, restart frame, step in target supports, the step in targets, the terminate request. <coughs> All right, yeah, so lots of stuff to look into. Supports configuration done requests. It seems like that's minimally something worth putting in there. When the initialized response has been sent, we need to send the initialized event. All right, sounds good. We use the register sent handler to ensure the event is sent after the initialized response. Okay. The thread request queries the debuggy, debugger's list of active threads. This example debugger only exposes a single thread. Same for us. Can I const expert? Oh, because this is a, a non const expirable class. Huh. Okay. Oh, I see. DAP integer. Interesting. Okay, fair enough. Oh, 
Okay, so stack trace request reports to stack frames, call stack for a given thread. This example debug debugger only exposes a single stack frame for the single thread. Yeah. So obviously I need to implement this. I have support for stack frames. Um, just thinking, can I can I do source level debugging for now without stack traces? Without a stack frame? Probably. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll just copy this. I'm thinking this is probably the, the meat of actually being able to see because I see that there's source reference in here and then there's the scopes request reports all the scopes of the given stack frame. Locals. Let me see again. Yeah, so there's the, the stack frame here, and there's the variables. I guess we could actually see it here. If we were to go to the session here, no, what happened to my hello debugger? If we did not actually register these, would it still work? Like what's the minimal amount we need here? Even variables, let's say I took all of this out. Or actually, let's just start by removing these two here. Um, stack trace and scope. Yeah, so you see it's not actually doing much anymore. So this really is the meat. In fact, I'm guessing it's the top one here. I think scopes less. And it makes sense, right? It wants a stack frame so that it can start showing you code for the current stack frame. Uh, let's see here, F F5. Yeah, so okay, so there we go. And why can't I debug? Why would it need this? Okay, so it really looks like it wants, or maybe it's just because I need to give, at least need to send a response. That's probably what it is. Uh, I can't just comment out the whole handler. So if I was to like send a default response, maybe this would work. Yeah, okay, that makes more sense. And then same for here. What if I don't have all of this? Would this work? Oh, yeah, over commented there. It's here. <laughs> I 
Okay, so this is really the thing that gives it the source code. Like without this paused, like it's running, but it's not showing us any source because it gets the source from right here. If I go here, because I saw that source reference ID was, was hand, so I saw this source request here and I thought that this would be the place where it got source code from, but looks like it does it through the stack trace request. Uh, I suppose it makes sense. If it wants to show us where it's at, it needs to have a stack frame. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so we're gonna need to, sh to do this. And I mean, and ultimately this is the point, right? Like we need to, uh, we need to do this. Let me just see what else is required. So variables, I don't think we need this. Now I'm like, on, I'm wondering, do I need to at least handle the request? So what happens if I don't? Oh, whoops. Okay, so that's fine. So we do need to at least handle scopes, but not variables. Obviously, I don't think we need to do pause, continue, and next, but all of those, uh, well, actually, I'm not sure about that. If we don't handle these, then what will those buttons do? But anyway, that's fine. We can leave those in. These are easy. Step in, set breakpoints. Probably don't need to do this. And I'm wondering if when we were looking at... Um, the, um, where is it? The initial uh, supports configuration done. Was there, was, was there something about breakpoints here? Yeah, there's all this stuff about supporting special kinds, supports function breakpoints. Is it because like this is true by default? I guess these are all false by default. Yeah. It's curious because um, we don't say we support function breakpoints here and yet we can set them. So I don't know, I don't know what that means. <laughs> Let me try and remove this just to see. Okay, so it still works. I just can't set breakpoints, or at least it looks like I can, but they don't do anything because the message isn't handled. Fair enough. All right, so I'm gonna stop doing that. I'm gonna come back up here. So it looks like we really do want the stack trace request, yeah. So I think the way it works is that it wants you to set a source reference. Now here in this example, the source reference is being provided by the debugger. That's not really what we wanna do, I think. What we want, is that true? No, actually we do want, so so what's the, so one thing about this, this example is that it provides the source, you know, like it just basically creates this like string. This is the source right here. So in our case, we, we parse those RST files. We, um, we know about the source. We know where we are. And we're basically going to 
um, display. There's sort of like two ways to do this. The user will will hit a hit a five to start debugging, and when they pause, we're going to want to display the current location, assuming it's mapped to a source file. And one thing I know is that there's sort of like two ways. Either we serve the source or we use the source that's already been, that the, the user is already looking at. And I, I think in this case, we would want to not serve it. Like we want to use what the, the user is looking at. Like I have main CPP here. I don't want another window with a different main CPP to open up. I want this one here to show. And I think DAP supports that through that source um, source request here. I have to, to do some more reading on this. Excuse me. Yeah, I don't think this is the place to be looking actually. Maybe this one here? Oh, it's the same thing. Okay, so set function breakpoints is a little bit different. In response to the initialized event, the development tool sends the configuration information using these requests. The set breakpoints request registers all breakpoints that exist for a single source. So it is not incremental. A simple implementation of these semantics in the debug adapter is to clear all previous breakpoints for the source and then set the breakpoints specified in the request. So I think a function breakpoint is, is one where we say, when we enter the function break. I see. So the adapter starts a debugger, it responds with capabilities, sends an initialized event, then then the tool will send set breakpoint request. We'll say break uh, response for breakpoints. Set exception breakpoint catch. Status is done. Configuration done. Launch. So whenever the program stops on a program entry. Uh, on program entry, because a breakpoint was hit, an exception occurred, or the user requested execution to be paused, the debug adapter sends a stopped event with the appropriate reason and thread ID. Upon receipt, develop, the development tool first requests the threads, and then the stack trace, a list of stack frames, for the thread mentioned in the stopped event. If the user then drills into the stack frame, the development tool first request, requests the scopes for a stack frame. and then the variables for a scope. Oh, that's cool, okay, so that makes more sense. If a variable is itself structured, the development tool requests its properties through additional variables requests. This leads to the following request waterfall. 
threads, stack traces, stack trace, scopes, variables. The value of variables can be modified through the set variable request. Very nice. I don't really care too much about threads. Thread ID must be used in all requests which refer to a thread. Okay. Excuse me. So nothing here about, um, I was looking for something about source and serving source, maybe in the specification. pretty light on the <laughs> on the details here okay let me see there source reference ID name is this okay so what's adapt source let me go take a look here a source is a descriptor for source code it is returned from the debug adapter as part of a stack frame and it is used by clients when specifying breakpoints oh so is it possible that since it sends okay it'll send the breakpoints for the sources hmm The short name of the source. Every source returned from the debug adapter has a name. When sending a source to the debug adapter, this name is optional. The optional origin of the source. The path of the or source to be shown in the UI. An optional hint for how to present the source in the UI. Now, if source reference is greater than zero, the contents of the source must be retrieved through the source request, even if a path is specified. Ah, okay. A source reference is only valid for a session, so it must not be used to persist a source. The value should be less than or equal to what? Why does it say that? Oh, sorry. Okay. The max value. Okay. I'm getting tired. Basically, a signed int. Um, if it's greater than zero, the contents of the source must be retrieved through the source request. So I think what this is saying is that if the source reference is zero, then it is a real file. Even if a path is specified. Okay, so I think the way this works is if we leave this, if we leave source reference to zero, but provide a path that is valid, you know, like, 
you know, if I pass the path here to main, then VS Code will know, okay, this is the file, you know? So it doesn't have to like produce like a virtual view of the file. I think that's that's the key here. All right, that makes sense. So I won't be actually setting the source reference. <clears throat> All right, so in order for me to do to actually be implement, able to implement this, I'm going to have to do some work. So is this build? Okay, so what what I need to do I have code obviously in my other debugger to uh, stack uh, track call stacks, right? I'm going to be bringing that code in to this debugger. Um, every time I execute an instruction, I'll do the, the same kind of thing I'm doing there, which is, in fact, I guess I don't have the copy here anymore. But yeah, it's to inspect the instruction, see if it's a call. If it is, build up a call stack. So all that code I have in my other debugger, I'll migrate to here for call stack tracking. Uh, once I have that, then whenever I get a break, like when, then I can implement basically this uh, stack trace request um, because I'll be able to look at my call stack, right? And part of that will be to say, okay, well, what's the instruction I'm at right now? Um, in fact, do I need to do the call stack tracking? Actually, I don't. I don't need to do this. I, I will need to if I want to actually show a proper call stack, but I think before I even get there, I can do this. Oh, it's built, yeah. I think I can do this even now simply by looking at the current instruction. So let's see what we can do. thinking this will be happening on another thread I want my debugger to be paused I think it only makes requests anyway when we're paused right I'm gonna also need to support paused but ultimately what I want to be doing here is something like Get CPU. Registers. So we get the registers from the CPU and we get its its program counter. And uh, you know what? I'll put the type here. Uint sixteen t. And then what we want to do is we want to look in our symbols. So I have add source location. So I'm going to need to go do some work on here to say, get me a source location. Oh, you know what? I'll just do pointer. So given an address, uh, I'll go and say source locations dot find. Oh, actually, yeah, I don't need to do that. That's right. I have a source. Okay, yeah, I didn't. Hmm. That's right. Okay, let's do this.
All right, so we'll look it up and we'll try to return it. Hello, get source location for the current program counter. If we have a location, so now this location, if I could type, has our file in our line, right? So that's what we need to fill up in our frame down here, right? I probably should put like the short name here not the full name right because that's usually what it looks like up here so to do short file name the line column one is fine uh, the name of the frame so this this I don't know yet uh, so I'll just put like frame zero to do get from call stack frame ID. So what's the deal with the frame ID? This is an identifier for the stack frame. It must be unique across all threads. This ID can be used to retrieve the scopes of the frame with the scopes request or to restart the execution of a stack frame. Okay, so I don't really have an ID right now, but once I have my call stack in there, I'll, I'll put a frame ID. Use a unique ID from call stack. And then here we set the source. Let's make our response up here. We'll add this here and then we'll always return a response. All right. Cool. Let's make sure this builds. So guys, it's 11.30, so uh, I'm gonna have to stop. It's getting late. Um, but you know, it looks like we're getting there. It's starting to get exciting. So in a couple days, I should be streaming again on, on Thursday. Uh, so I think we'll pick up from here. What's next is to just continue trying to get this minimal source level debugging thing going. Um, I think we're pretty close. Like I think, you know, right now if I, I think, I don't think it's gonna work if I launch from here, but. Why did it launch? Just curious, X64 release. Am I pointing at the right version? Give me one second here. So this path here, whoops.
Yeah, it's the same one. Oh no, yeah, no, it's doing the right thing. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. No, I think I think everything's everything's good. Uh, there is, I think, one step that I have to do at the end. Once I've registered all handlers, we're supposed to do a bind. Yeah, that's what it is. Once I've bound the session, then I can do the thread started event, and I have to pause my debugger. Okay. Yeah. So there's a little bit more to do, but. Um, almost there so yeah so join me in a couple nights and uh, we'll, we'll pick it up uh, we'll pick it up from here and hopefully we'll start getting some source level debugging so thanks for watching guys and uh, I'll see you in a couple nights